Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Hillary Iskin. I'm one of the primary care R3s at the Belltown Clinic, for those of you I haven't met. Um, if my internet starts to get wonky, someone can maybe shoot me a text and I'll turn off my video because you don't really need to see my face while I do the presentation. Um, before I tell you what this talk is about, unless you already saw it when I was setting up my slides, I'd love if we could just start with a case and a poll that Javel has been kind enough to help us set up. So put yourself in the mindset you're admitting on card day or for the R3s, maybe you're admitting on Harborview cards. And you get a call from the ER to admit a 55-year-old woman who's complaining of chest pain. They tell you that her EKG doesn't have any STEMI, but she does have an elevated trope at 0.5. CTPE was negative. You admit her, and the next day, her studies show an echo with a normal EF. Angiogram shows clean coronaries. And she's pain-free. She's ready to discharge home. So what is the diagnosis that you're going to put on her discharge paperwork? So Choice A, non-cardiac chest pain. Choice B, a type 2 MRI. Choice C, an acute MRI. Or choice D, something else. If you guys, what, 30 seconds? And all of you primary care R2s, you have to answer individually at your viewing party. Ten more seconds. Sweet. Okay, this is interesting. So um, we get eight percent think it's non-cardiac. Forty-five percent think that this is a type two MI. 13% think it's an acute MI, and a third of you think it's something else. Somebody put answer choice E, um, which is the right in option, I guess. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you guys for doing that poll. So moving forward, so um, if I can do this. Okay, so today's talk is about this entity called MINOCA, and this stands for MI with non-obstructive coronary artery. Um, I have no financial disclosures to report to you, um, but like the other presenters this morning, I am not a cardiologist. I'm a generalist and a future primary care doctor. And I will mention I this episode or this this talk was inspired in large part by a Curbsiders episode um, that I'll link to you guys at the end that was done by an actual cardiologist who's an expert in this field. Um, and also, I think that this topic, even though the case that I just presented was an inpatient case, I think that this topic is very relevant for future inpatient doctors and future primary care or some practice doctors. So our learning objectives for today is that I hope that by the end, I'll be able to share with you a working knowledge of causes of MI other than the classic obstructive CAD, and that we can reflect this, this working knowledge in our language to um, promote equity and to reduce the morbidity that results from gender disparities when we think about cardiac PCM. So the second and final poll, so this patient has had a myocardial infarction. So I'd love if you guys would do this, this will be another poll. So have you heard of this entity of Minoka before? Answer choice A, yes, I've heard of it. B, not sure. And C is no. Okay, this is super helpful. Okay, so um, a third of you, yes, have heard of it. Um, Anisha, I didn't realize you counted for a third of the people on this on this talk. Um, B, 14% are not sure, and C, 51% have not. Okay, this is really helpful. Thank you guys. Um, and for those who know more about this topic than I do, um, please chime in and help me out, or those who are cardiology bound, because again, I'm not an expert. Um, I've been learning alongside you as I, as I put this together. All right, so let's get to the meat of this. So um, I'm gonna start with the American College of Cardiology's fourth universal definition of acute MI. We all think we know what an MI is, but this is the actual clinical definition. Um, 
detection of bio in, in the appropriate clinical setting, detection of biomarkers, aka a troponin of some kind, and at least one of the following. So symptom ischemic EKG changes, including pathologic Q waves, imaging evidence of new loss of viable myocardium, um, and identification of a coronary thrombus by angiography. disease. So I just want to call out that an MI is not defined by seeing by findings on angiography. It's great if there is, yes, that is, that fits within this diagnostic paradigm. But this is a, our, in our case, this is a patient who came in with an elevated troponin and chest pain. And then I'll just, as a reminder, the ACC AHA guidelines for secondary prevention in patients who have had acute coronary syndrome or have had an MI, it's the four magic pills. So aspirin, ACE ARB, uh, beta blockers, high intensity stat. So when a patient meets this criteria, they should be treated with this medication. So if we think about our classic teaching of, of what is an MI, we think about plaque rupture. This pretty little picture came from the CDC website showing us a lovely you know, development of plaque, plaque rupture, blood flow stop. This is your classic obstructive CAD. Um, the, this term of Minoka is, it comes in when we think about patients like the patient I presented in this case who um, have had an MI but don't have the classic angiographic findings that we think of as obstructive coronary artery disease. So this Minoka or MI with non-obstructive coronary artery disease is an umbrella term for a myocardial infunction, a myocardial infarction without obstructive KD that's characterized by what we think of as normal or near normal epicardial artery pain, epicardial arteries being the, the classic, you know, LAD, the large coronary arteries. Um, and then in the absence of, of other non-coronary causes. So um, in the original like studies by DeWood about MIs, which I think were done you know, in the 1950s or somewhere thereabouts, they, they defined stenosis as 50%. Or greater, and so that's where this definition of 50% or less comes from. Um, and then this this term of Minoka is is really an umbrella term that describes a clinical syndrome, sort of in the way that heart failure is a term for a clinical syndrome that doesn't tell us the specific etiology. Um, there are, as you can see in this, I made this little graphic for you guys. This this is this shows some of the entities that are classified under Minoka, and I'll just say that. Um, there are a lot of, there's some variability in what different experts consider to be part of Minoka. Sometimes type 2 MI is included here, but I think that for clarity, we're, we're not going to include that. And most of the papers that I was reading do not include sort of classic supply demand defense as part of Minoka. Um, so some of the things that can be, that can be uh, classified under here. So coronary artery spasm, what we think of as vasospastic angina, can certainly cause an MI, and it's not going to show obstructive PAD. That is spontaneous coronary artery dissection. We can also have an acute thrombosis at the site of a non-obstructive eccentric plaque. Pocket tubo cardiomyopathy sometimes gets classified under here. Um, one that I think is particularly interesting is this concept of coronary microvascular dysfunction. So you can have essentially atherosclerosis of the small vessels that's not going to be seen angiographically, but is, is a, certainly a cause of MI. Viral myocarditis sometimes gets classified under here too. This one I'm a little bit less comfortable with, but it, in many of the papers it is included. And then coronary artery embolism is also part of Minoka. So I'm going to show you, there's one, another way that I think we can think about this, and I, I made this little graphic too, so forgive me. but um, the way that I'm the way that I'm thinking about, about this is, you know, we have a patient with chest pain and troponin. So the first thing is to look at non-cardiac disorders that are causing a troponin. And so that's things like a PE. And so I put this over here, the non-cardiac. You have a positive troponin with non-obstructive coronaries. PE is over here. Um, and then you have this other large bucket, which are the troponin positive obstructive coronary arteries. That's your that's your, meant to be your classic PE. Um, and then you come to the Minoka bucket in the middle here, which um, has some overlap with these with these various other syndromes. So, so the coronary embolism that we talked about, I you know I, I conceptualize that as being something obstructive. Um, so that I that I put in the overlap here. And then in the Minoka alone bucket, you have your SCAD, your spasm, and your microvascular dysfunction. Then you have some overlap here with the myocardial disorders, the Takotsubo, um, and then other etiologies of myocarditis. 
And then you have type GMI, which um, you know, is, is not typically classified as part of Minoka, but is going to cause positive troponin um, and is not going to have obstructive um, coronary artery disease. So before we move on, I wonder, are there, are there questions that I can attempt to answer or others who want to chime in and add something before we, before we move forward and dig into this a little bit more? Um, Anisha is asking me to define a type 2 MI more explicitly. Yeah, so Anisha, I think of a type 2 MI as a supply demand mismatch. So that's, um, let's take an example of a patient who is, has, does not have known outstanding cardiac disease, but has, goes into septic shock and has uh, some troponin elevation in the setting of um, increased oxygen demand from the myocardium with a fixed supply. Anisha, what else do you, what would you add to that? Uh, do you need coronary artery disease, like non-obstructive coronary artery disease, to have a type 2 end STEMI? That's an interesting question. I, I think that you do, um, but I'm not an expert on that. I, you know, I think of, we see a lot of patients who come to the hospital and we say, oh, they have a small troponin leak, they have a type 2 MI. But you know, when, I, when I go for a run, when I run a 10K, I don't leak troponins, I don't think. So I do think there's some overlap. Um, and maybe that's why some of these, some authors put type 2 MI as overlapping with Minoka. Maybe there's some underlying microvascular dysfunction that we're not seeing. You can look how close, look on my graphic, look how close they are to each other. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, we'll move on. So um, here's some, I brought some epidemiology for us. So um, this graphic here comes from the, the 2021 update to the um, heart disease and stroke statistics that was published in the circulation um, earlier this year. So on the y-axis, we have death in thousands. On the x-axis, we have time. Um, and then the blue line represents, um, uh, I believe it's defined sex at birth, so males and females, um, although I'm not entirely sure what the, what the, how these are defined. But, um, this is showing us uh, cardiovascular disease deaths over time. We can see that for a long time, for decades, women actually had higher cardiovascular, a higher rate of cardiovascular death than men. Both have declined over time, but both are and they're actually now sort of creeping back up. Um, men outpacing women at this point, but both still quite high. And just want to call out that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death for women and for men. Um, and up to 10% of patients who present, who have, diag who have um, diagnostic angiograms do not have evidence of obstructive CAD. And this goes back again to some of these, these studies by DeWood back in the 50s where they would, you know, they, the, the way that they presented it was, okay, 90% of these patients who have these symptoms of troponin have obstructive CAD. That, that's what an MI is. But if you flip that, this is where that 10, part of where that 10% comes from. Um, and these, these Minoka patients are more likely to be younger and they're more often women compared to ACS patients with obstructive coronary artery disease. There's, there is still a male predominance in Minoka. It is just not as large of a male predominance as obstructive CT. The, the traditional risk factors are similar. So diabetes, smoking, hypertension, family history, and we'll get a little bit more into that in a minute. And then this, okay, this graphic I stole directly from the Curbsiders uh, episode. They made this beautiful thing for their, for their episode. Um, and we can take a look at this in terms of looking at the disparity between men and women in ischemic heart disease. So this, when we think about MIs is only occurring with obstructive CAD, we miss 30 to 40% of women with heart disease. And we also miss 5% of men with heart disease that we should be treating. So if we look at this graphic, um, you know, heart disease in women is different. So um, in people with ACS or angina, 50% of men go for calf, only 42% of women tend to go for calf. If we look at obstructive disease, 65% um, of women who are calves are diagnosed with obstructive disease versus 93% of men. And then in terms of medical management, the, the rates are about, or the, the, the treatment uh, proportions are similar, that 
um, about 75% of men, 79% of women diagnosed with obstructive PAD are prescribed the guideline drugs and medical therapy. But if we come instead over to the non-obstructive, and I really like this graphic here because you know, on the obstructive, we're seeing sort of the, this like black, like the LAD or whatever that is supposed to be. That's your classic obstructive. Whereas this, I think they're showing us a really nice little graphic of what the microvascular disease might look like. It's a little black thing, small little arteries or arterioles that we are not classically gonna see in geographically. So if we look at these folks who, who meet this non-obstructive paradigm, 35% of women who go for CAT are diagnosed with non-obstructive PAD versus 7% of men. And both men and women who are, who are diagnosed with non-obstructive disease are under treated. So 40, 50% of men and women in, in that category prescribed aspirin, beta blockers, and statin, with an overall death rate between men and women of, of five to six. Um, okay, I see a chat from Andrew. Is there is there an indication for ACE with non-obstructive CAD with normal EF? And and we'll get into that um, in a minute here. Yeah, the the, answer, the short answer, Andrew, is that there is it's a data-free abyss. And so um, I have some expert. I have one study to show you, and I there was an observational study, and then there's expert recommendations. But the the short answer is, is yes. Is that we're saying they had an MI, we should probably be treating them. Um, and then another question from Mish, do you have any insight why the gender despair is narrower in Minoka? Is this related to more parity in microvascular disease? I hear people in both estrogen withdrawal. Yeah, um, I think that, that that's a that's a very meaty question, Anisha. Um, there's, you know, there's this this one theory that sort of men and women lay down plaque differently, and that, that may, you know, men, the classic lumpy bumpy um, plaque that's more likely to cause obstructive CAD versus women laying down centric plaque that's more likely to lead to thrombosis on top of a non-obstructive plaque. Um, there's lots of sort of hormone-related theories. Does it have to do with microvascular disease? Does it have to do with vasospasm that we see more in women or, or fibromuscular dysplasia type etiologies that we see more in women than in men? The short answer is I, I don't know for sure, but I think that that, is, that question is really at the heart of, I think, the importance of this topic. These are amazing questions. Thanks, you guys. Um, all right, so then I just stuck in this slide. This is like a slight departure, but this is this is about um, ischemic heart disease in general, not just Minoka, but I wanted to just pull attention to what we think of as risk factors and how they apply to women specifically. This also comes from a, a paper that was published in Circulation. Um, this one's from 2018. So um, if we look at the ones in blue, we're looking at our traditional risk factors for ischemic heart disease. So we look at hyperlipidemia, this is a nice reminder that menopause results in higher LDL and lower LDL, that women are less likely to achieve their lipid goals, um, that hypertension is very commonly not adequately controlled in many of our patients, and that includes women, that diabetes confers a higher risk of ischemic heart disease, as does smoking, as does obesity, although reportedly obesity confers a higher risk in women than it does in men and that women have higher prevalence of inactivity with 25% of US women not getting any regular physical activity. I say this as I sit on my butt in my home giving a presentation. Um, and that family history also confers a risk of premature atherosclerosis. Then if we come over to the red, we're looking at sort of emerging risk factors. And, and one of those is autoimmune disease, which, which as we know is much more common in women than in men. Um, and that both of these dramatically increase the risk of ischemic heart disease, something that we often forget about. And then we have some, some etiologies that are specific to women, um, which include gestational diabetes and hypertension in pregnancy. I think I um I don't think of those very often when I'm in clinic and I you know I'm speaking with a woman who's in her 40s or 50s. I'm I don't I, I very rarely ask her, you know, did you have any side effects with your childbearing? Did you have any diabetes? Did you have any hypertension? But this is a reminder to me that we need to consider those as well when we're constructing our risk paradigm for, for our female patients. And, and along with early menopause, that this con confers a 4.5 times higher risk of ischemic heart disease. Um, and that depression also um, is, a, is a risk factor for ischemic heart disease. Um, I know I should be on the treadmill. I should get, um, Anisha, I should get like a walking, any one of those walking desks, like the tech, tech people. All right. <laughs> um, I'm gonna bring us back now to talking about Minoka. So, this is where we where we can talk about the workup for Minoka. This is where we start to like work with our cardiology colleagues. Um, 
like uh, Dr. Dole over in the cath lab. Um, but to, to start as a way to think about this, at the top here is Minoka, and as a reminder, here is here again is our is our that is our definition. So someone who meets the criteria for a universal acute MI has does not have angiographic stenosis at or greater than 50%, and no overt causes, meaning no PE, they're not in septic shock, some other thing that, that is causing their proponent leak. So, like we do in most of our patients who we admit for, for cardiovascular disease, we think about, um, you know, we're going to get an A1C, we're going to rule out a PE, we might get a thrombophilia screen, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then if we think about other invasive investigations, this, a lot of this stuff has to happen in the CAD lab. Um, so looking for subtle angiography findings like dissection, emboli, plaque disruption, um, evaluating in the cath lab for uh, coronary spasm, and so, some experts use intracoronary nitrates, um, and some, some do a, a provocative spasm testing. The other, the other, the, um, the other tools that are mentioned a lot in the papers I was reading is, are IVIS, um, looking for plaque rupture, erosion, dissection in the cath lab while you're there. And then the others, and, and oh, as long with, um, there are, oops, that's too fast, along with um, pressure and Doppler wire, looking for microvascular dysfunction in the cath lab. And I'm not an expert on these different tools and when they're used, but um, I think it's a nice reminder for me that there's a lot that can be done in the cath lab when the patient is first on the table, but there's more to look for in the report just besides just, did they have 99% stenosis of the LAD or did they not? But there's a lot of subtleties here. And then we almost always are gonna get uh, TTE on these patients, so that's included as well. And then if we come down sort of further, now we're looking a little further down this algorithm, um, uh, we can, you know, we can look for things sort of what, are we able to confirm an etiologic diagnosis from Minoka or are we not? And so here they've included type two MI as part of Minoka, but like we've talked about, that's, that's a gray area, I think. And then our other etiologies down here. If the diagnosis has not yet been confirmed, then I think there's a role for potentially cardiac MR, other advanced imaging. Um, that's a little bit, that's mostly beyond the scope of this talk, but just, just as a reminder that there's a lot of tools we have in our toolbox, particularly at our advanced tertiary um, medical centers. Um, and then I just wanted to mention too that there is, there's like a, some subtleties potentially to interpreting the, the echo, the TTE, that um, regional wall motion abnormalities could indicate an epicardial cause of Minoka, like vasospasm or thrombosis um, on a non-obstructive plaque. Um, LV, uh, Echo with apical ballooning with akinesis or dyskinesis, et cetera, that suggests Takas Kubo. Uh, and that in our patient, this is not about the echo, but that in our patients with prosthetic valves, AFib, et cetera, you know, uh, risks for uh, thrombosis that they that we should remember to think about coronary artery embolism in those patients. All right, so what I thought we might do now is dive a little bit deeper into just a couple of these all etiologies that I think are particularly interesting. Um, and, and relevant for our, this discussion of Minoka. So this first one is called SCAD, and I, I wish that these names, that these etiologists had like more interesting sounding names, but SCAD, SCAD stands for Spontaneous Coronary Artery Dissection. And so I have a little, um, I have a little graphic here on the left from um, a paper that was published in Vascular Medicine in 2017. And this is basically showing how you can within the epicardial coronary arteries develop um, a false lumen from a uh, uh, disruption of the intima and then how that can narrow the, uh, the lumen, the true lumen. So SCAD is more common in young women. And this again is where there's this, this um, hypothesis that sex related hormones may be playing a pathogenetic role. The true prevalence of SCAD is not really known, but um, there's this question of sort of in younger women, and, and that's not, I don't have a clear definition of that, that maybe 20% of MI in younger women is due to SCAD. Treatment is at this point just, just aspirin. There's no need to treat with statins. Um, patients are not usually left with persistent chest pain. And interestingly, this arterial injury usually heals over on its own with time. And so conservative management is recommended. It is not usually recommended that those patients be treated with PCI or stenting or surgical revascularization. 
um, those outcomes haven't played out. And you know, I think there are certain you know, complicated scenarios where that might be indicated, but in most cases, it's not. Um, and then post discharge, uh, risk of major adverse cardiac events, such as that um, outcome that's used in all kinds of studies, but is a composite outcome that includes, um, you know, cardiovascular disease, death adverse events, including stroke, um, that that risk is up to 10 to 20%. And so one of the recommendations for patients who are diagnosed with GAD um, is that they should have screening for fibromuscular dysplasia because there is a strong correlation between GAD and fibromuscular dysplasia and other vascular events. The other recommendation from the experts with regards to GAD is that if a person is on estrogen replacement therapy, either um, for use as a contraceptive or as a postmenopausal treatment, that there's room there for some shared decision making about considering stopping. Or, or I should say, I I um I think there's a complete dearth of evidence in people who are taking estrogen for uh, gender affirming therapy. But that I think is another group where it's worth considering and talking with the patient that that their estrogen may confer an increased risk for further major adverse cardiac events. Questions about SCAD or other questions so far? All right. Is there is there any um, concern for like hypertension management in SCAD? That's an interesting question. You know, in the same way that we think of sort of hypertension in like aortic dissection, I I didn't see that, um, but I think that 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 is a really interesting question. I mean. I'm sure these patients benefit from normalization of blood pressures. Jordan's asking when I say screening for fibromuscular dysplasia, what tests are recommended? I actually don't know the answer to that. What specific tests? I'd have to look at them. Does anyone happen to know? Okay. Well, we'll think about that and we'll move on. So the, the second etiology that I thought is particularly interesting here that I wanted to delve into is this, is this question of coronary microvascular dysfunction. And, and this is the one, if you remember back to the Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just go back a couple of slides. The, um, this on the right, this non-obstructive with the little black lines coming off showing microvascular dysfunction. And that's what I'm referring to here. Um, and this graphic also came from um, that paper in vascular medicine in 2017. So um, a few different potential etiologies for microvascular dysfunction. So one is extravascular sort of compression, reduced diastolic filling time. And I think that also gets into this question of type 2 MI. Um, where's the line between Minoka caused by coronary microvascular dysfunction versus reduced diastolic filling time in the setting of systemic illness called a type 2 MI. And I think that, that those, there's some nuance there that I, that I am not an expert in. Um, I think more, more relevant to this talk today are sort of the, the luminal obstruction, vascular wall infiltration remodeling, perivascular fibrosis, all sort of structural causes that can affect the microvasculature causing dysfunction there. And then other causes, potentially endothelial dysfunction, autonomic dysfunction, um, that may that may contribute um, to the to the functioning of the microvasculature in the heart. And again, coronary microvascular dysfunction is one of the etiologies of MNOCA that is thought to be more common in women. Um, all right. So let's move. And I know I haven't addressed all of the different etiologies of MNOCA. I, I picked these out because I think that they are particularly interesting. They're more common in women and their etiologies that I was had not heard of, was not familiar with before I started looking into this topic. Um, so when we think about treatment of Minoka, and there's been some chatter um, in the chat, thanks guys, uh, uh, um, for kind of, well, that's where we're going next. So the bottom line is the treatment depends on the cause. So for patients who have evidence of atherosclerotic disease in their coronary circulation, meaning they don't have 0% stenosis, they don't have greater than 50%, they're somewhere in that non-obstructive realm, without any other cause for Minoka, the experts recommend, do recommend DAPT, beta blocker, and statin. I, I have one study to show you, and this is really an example of how limited the literature is. This, I love this. This is like the best study title I've ever heard. It's called the Swede Heart Studies. It's done on a Swedish. Um, it's a retrospective cohort study with data 
pulled from Swedish, um, like essentially vital statistics registries and combined with hospital billing and coding data. So they looked at over 9,000 patients who were admitted to the hospital, um, were discharged with a diagnosis of M acute MI, survived 30 days post-discharge, and then had an anti and in, in, during that admission had an angiogram that did not show obstructive PAD. Um, and then the exposure that was assessed was their treatment and discharge with each of these medications, so statin, graft blockade, beta blockade, and gap. And their outcome that they were looking at was this, this MACE, which we talked about is a composite measure. So bottom line is 24% of these patients went on to experience MACE in the 10 years that this study um, had follow-up. There was demonstration of a beneficial effect of statins independently and RAS blockade independently. There was, um, there, this, there was no um, statistically significant benefit of beta blocker or GAP in these patients. Um, and I think, you know, this, this study is like rife with limitations. So it's based on coding. So, you know, like th that diagnosis of MI without, without angiogram evidence of obstructive CD is based entirely on Swedish patients. Of course, it was an observational study, not a clinical trial. And then I also think, you know, we've just finished talking about how Minoka is an umbrella term with a lot of different etiologies. This, this study obscures all of that, what is likely significant variability, heterogeneity within that population of diverse etiologies. That being said, um, I think it's interesting to see that there is some benefit among this group um, for ACE ARB and um, All right. So looking back to our case, so we just, the, the case back at the beginning, so we already said the diagnosis for this woman is that she's had an acute MI. Um, there's some question about, you know, what additional, if you're taking care of this patient in the hospital, what additional investigation should be done? And what, if any, new meds should she go home on? So I put this together the way we might write it for our note, um, <laughs> that we're going to call this that she's had an acute MI, we can call it Minoka, that we've ruled out non-cardiac causes of her troponin leak and her symptoms. And I, I added in, let's say angiography showed 40% stenosis, which suggests some, some burden of atherosclerotic disease, potentially microvascular disease with etiology. So I would recommend that we start this patient on guideline-directed medical therapy. And, and the expert recommendation at this point is for patients like this, to discharge them on aspirin, uh, P2Y12 receptor blocker for treatment inhibition, beta blocker and a um, You know, we, we just saw from the sweetheart study, she's likely to benefit as well from an ACE or R, you know, depending on what her blood pressure is. Um, and then we wanna, we wanna assess her for other risk factors. So, you know, what's her A1C? Is she on hormone replacement therapy? Does she need cardiac rehab? All those sorts of things. Let me take a quick pause look in the chat. Okay, people are talking about how you look for fibromuscular dysplasia, um, looking at the carotids, et cetera. Okay, um, so to wrap things up, I, I just want to call out very explicitly that it, the language here matters a lot, that when we say CAD or coronary artery disease, that that, that points us towards this obstructive disease paradigm, and I think makes it easier for us to forget that there is a lot of diversity in what an MI really is. Um, and it points us towards this, I'm gonna call it out, male-centric paradigm, which leaves behind a lot of other people who deserve treatment. And also, as we said, 5% of men also um, who, who deserve treatment. So I have started using this term um, ischemic heart disease um, instead of CAD. I use it in my notes, I use it in my presentation. Uh, I also am thinking about this term ACS or acute coronary syndrome. I think that that term too has had its day in the sun and that term I'm thinking about phasing that out in my own language. Um, because again, it's, a, it's making it about the coronaries um, and not, again, not all ischemic heart disease is due to obstructive coronary um, plaque pressure. All right, so key takeaways. So we looked at the 
the universal definition of an MI, and it does not require obstructive CAD on angiogram. That when we focus on obstructive CAD alone, we miss 30 to 40% of women and 5% of men who've had heart attacks. And that when we expand our differential of ischemic heart disease to include Minoka, we, we benefit our patients and we're, we can start treatment on those who, who likely need it. Although again, the data is quite sparse. So here is my like smorgasbord of references. I wanna be sure to thank a few people. Um, Dr. Sarah Steinkruger, who I know many of you know, has helped me a lot prepare this presentation. Um, and then also a thank you to the, um, the other folks on the teaching pathway, so Renata and Anushamta for their help, and uh, Whitney also for kind of helping me think through the structure of this presentation. And then um, a big plug for the, the Curbsiders um, podcast. So Dr. This, it's sort of down at the bottom third here, Heart Disease in Women with Dr. Barry Murs. Um, podcast number 153 from January of 2021 uh, really uh, is what started me on the path to think about this, to change my language. And she's very clearly an expert. I also, you know, several of my re uh, references here um, include her as an author as well. So that's what I have for today. What other um, questions, comments, expert tidbits um, do folks have? Cool. Well, we finished early. Turn it back to you, Nina. Thanks, Hillary. Um, great job, everyone. Thank you to our fantastic speakers today. Um, and what a great discussion in the chat as well. So we are done with Academic Captive for this morning. Uh, we will see you again. Actually, next week will be um, 